Creating an image is no more a mystery. I mean, everybody is seeing an image all the time on their mobile phones. The horizon is very important in a composition which give you a sense of freedom. One thing which has not changed in AR is his musical modesty. AR is the next question because mm -hmm. I was going to ask, you guys have been friends for a very long time and you worked on many projects together, even ads and things like that. But between Kandu Konde and the present, he went off, won a couple of Oscars, began jet setting all over the world and you know it's so hard to get a hold of him. How was it making music with this AR as opposed to that uh, AR who was more Chennai based and rooted and things like that? It's, easy. it's definitely the world has changed and definitely uh, the world now recognizes AR as um, kind of Mozart or Madras or whatever it is. I, I mean, he, he's like really um, a legend right now. Right. But um, one thing that I was always struck by AR, you know, which is, um, I mean, he wasn't a person who could really, sp he wouldn't put down words. I mean, just he would just do his music, you know. I mean, I, I would talk a lot and then he would just turn around and just, just you know, on a flash. Uh, I would say, I wanted like Broadway and this fellow is coming here and this chap is going to jump here and he should do that and they should play, table should go here and the cl red cloth should be there and should be like a Spanish thing. And then suddenly this guy is saying that your nose is not good. I mean, uh, so he'll be watching all this, then he'll go. You're talking about stra da 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 da. strawberry. Yeah, so, so it's like the, how to get, how to start with the signature. I mean, you should call that girl. In all that, AR would not speak much but he would just do it now AR speaks a lot more he can actually uh, lucidly communicate what his musical ideas are rather than actually executing it on the keyboard so it's a great pleasure to now see um, a verbal AR vis-a-vis um, keyboard playing AR you know now a lot of his ideas are structural and uh, things and he has clear views now but one thing which is not changed in AR is his musical modesty. Now, he may be a person in a hurry, he has very little time and he's doing 101 other things. But I think with me, uh, there's a kind of, uh, we have a musical dialogue which uh, he, he's patient with me and he kind of listens to what's this bloke talking about. I mean, he's really mad about music and I know, but, um, but I, I, I guess he's, I can see some sense here. I mean, that, that's the vibe that has always been. And um, so he's, for him, it's the, the fact that music is part of a film and the film is really important. And he's a film geek and he's like a person who really loves films and watches films and you know, done a course in screenwriting. And, and so he is not like a composer who's saying, okay, let's look for the next hit. It, it's not that. I mean, there is a side of that, but... In this film, he is trying to say that, uh, let's do something more. And right. that aspect, that hunger that he had, has not diminished. He may have become a very big person, but with me, he has not been that at all. And I mean, why would he allow me to uh, do a song in the film? I mean, like, I mean, it just so happened that we tried composing something and just so happened that I I'm not a music composer or something like that. It just so happened that I've heard these stories that you know, Satyajit Ray would write and he could compose and I would marvel at that. I mean, I don't know how to play the keyboard. I don't know how to write things. But it just so happened that when I was writing a scene, I got one line and then Varalamo, uh, Narigil, Peralamo, Narulay, something like that. I mean, then, then that's formed into some kind of tune and now everybody has a cell phone and you take a cell phone and you record that tune. But then it took me some two or three months to have balls to go and tell AR, hey, listen, I have something. And then he he's accepting it. So he's incredibly musically modest he's ready to you know listen to people which he need not and it is very gracious of him to and then also give you credit i mean uh, i'm i'm delighted and touched by the fact that somebody as big as him could uh, a accept what i did b is also give credit I mean, there's just no need for him to do it you mentioned about the new verbal ar 2.0 mm -hmm. yeah. so to speak <laughs> <laughs> so uh, could you give an example you've just released your uh, uh, title track of yeah. uh, Sarvam Talamayam. Could you give an example of how you briefed AR Rahman and how the new verbal AR kind of bounced back ideas with you so that you got the final track? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we were clear that this is a journey that, he, that, you know, this guy is going to take all over India and, you know, we, we needed to sort of liberate the film from the confines of what's happening in probably... 
uh, one small, uh, you know, um, like one, three, five kilometers, square kilometers by square kilometers in Chennai or what's happening in Mylapur or what's happening somewhere. It, it, this is a story much larger than that. And um, while um, stories have to have a very local connect, it also needs to have a kind of universal appeal. And that's pretty much the same thing with music too. So what we thought is, what if we had a kind of a, uh, anthem uh, on rhythm and how can we kind of synergize what's actually ticking inside Bangra and what's ticking inside various folk and how do you sort of bring them all together in an anthem and that to me was a kind of a challenge you know and I mean there is you can use the the, the boat song and uh, you know you can cut their kind of visual metaphors but musically you cannot insist that you can do this. You can only suggest an idea. And then, so when it comes down, you, you need to have a kind of a pace in which you can bring in these other things. So, so then you kind of have a drum and bass kind of a uh, thing which sort of sets a loop into which you start bringing in uh, another thing. And so instead of using a really drum kit to do it, you have bass guitar and then you, we had uh, samples of actual ch chenda being recorded and a panchavadyam being recorded uh, by a friend of ours. And so we got the real sample, a real, real instrument playing. You know, that, that gives you a different feel to it. And then he used a bit of that. So he created his own uh, kind of signature uh, rhythm structure and said, that, let's do that. And then you shoot it. And then let's see what we can do with it. So we had this kind of bass track and we had this kind of anthem which was uh, just, just going. And then when we went on location and we would jam with these musicians, we would just... Um, with, with Rahman? No, no. Okay. We, ju we just, when we were going shooting, so we would play this music and then GB was there and then we would, uh, you know, hold a click track and then we would tell them, can you play at sea or the, the Shruti and wherever you can tune the instrument. And then on that same click, we would ask them to play their groove and then we would record it on location. So we recorded on, in, in Meghalaya, we recorded in Manipur, we recorded in Kashmir as well as in Thing and in Kerala. So what we recorded, we brought back to the studio and then we put that back into the, into the song. So it was like a kind of cross, uh, uh, like more like, um, uh, yeah, what do you call, uh, there used to be a program on television, like sound tripping, like some element of that we kind of had. It into. actually evolved. Yeah. It was not like, it was not fixed. It was, it's a series of kind of developments. And then we did some uh, bits like, um, I mean, even when you're traveling, even when the, because it's, those, it's a film about rhythm. So if can we have a hook phrase, which, you know, which is taking out from a little bit from Bharatanatyam, but uh, also mixing it with an acapella. So like, takadimi, takadimi, tam, 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 takadimi, takadimi, tom, 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 takadimi, takadimi, janata, janata, ta, 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 you know, that kind of a thing with Arjun Chandi bringing it in an acapella form. So it just gets a different feel to it. You mentioned J.V. Prakash and, you know, and he wa he's the lead actor and he's also a musician. Yeah. Did he contribute anything to the music? Yeah, I mean, I mean, def when we were on location, yeah, because of the fact that, you know, he was, but otherwise he is absolutely petrified of his uncle. He's like, no, I'm not saying anything. Boss, you both think of piercing it, I'll pay it to you now. He'll just help us record the, the stuff. And, but otherwise he's, he's, he's a very talented fellow. So like, so like ch charming chap. With the Kantukonda and Kantukonda, you mentioned that you held a lot of test screenings in order to plug the gaps, as you called it. Mm -hmm. um, did you have test screenings for Sarvam Talamayam as well? And if you did, can you mention a scene that you were able to tweak after this, the feedback that you got from the test screenings? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I did. Um, I, I believe in that. I think maybe because I come from the advertising background and uh, I... You know, we have an idea in our heads and, and that's the idea we then write and um, then we kind of uh, kind of edit it and do a lot of things. And sometimes um, somebody comes and says, this scene is not required and that scene is not required. You know, we want to bring it within 110 pages or something. So there are a lot of scenes that you write which, you know, you just remove and keep it. And then there's a reason why you have written it. I mean, you, and you forget that when you're doing some 15 drafts, why you wrote a scene and why that scene has been removed because you, you read, six, read draft number six and then do draft number seven. And then you make the film. And then when you put it together, 
and people see it. Like and in this particular case, I had the screening of the film, uh, and there were two young girls who um, were uh, from, uh, I thought, impoverished backgrounds or whatever it is. They, they, they were, but they were urban girls who were like 28 and 30 years old, and um, when they saw the film, they really liked everything, but they just didn't get the fact that he was uh, from the back uh, underprivileged caste or anything of that sort. They just didn't get the, the cast equation. They didn't get the, the, the G.V. Prakash character. Yeah. yeah, because we don't mention that he's a Dalit or anything in that sense, you know. There's no exclu exclusion zones in, in an urban uh, situation. And since the film is largely urban, um, there is no idea that, you know, somebody is like trying to say you, you shouldn't be part of this. Uh, and um, so they just couldn't get the cast angle at all. And these are kids who have gone to English medium, who have gone and gone to an engineering college, obviously on a private engineering college, and then gone and joined a, a software company. And they haven't experienced the caste system in any way or the ills of it, you know. So they may have been from a backward class background. So they are not used the uh, caste card ever or they have not used the reservation because they all, there is a parallel universe of these private engineering colleges where people are all paying money and getting in. So they don't know what it is. But that, that would be a problem for me because what is the barrier that we are talking about, they wouldn't get. And long time before, I had written a sequence of discrimination that he felt when he went to the village. So I had to bring when, that when scene. When the protagonist went to the village. Yeah. yeah. I had to bring back that scene because I realized... Uh, that the audience wasn't getting it. And what was amazing is because of that scene, the people in Japan and Tokyo could understand that there is discrimination. And that dis discrimination is like, you guys are polluted, you can't come here, you can't, you know, be with us. So what doesn't exist in the city as uh, kind of pure physical discrimination, uh, does exist in villages. And therefore it becomes necessary to understand uh, the caste matrix, you know. So uh, that decision was actually because it wasn't reaching the people and I had to put that back and I was in some ways delighted that that decision uh, which was based on like out of 10 people, 4 people didn't get it. So I, 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 I what I had written, I, re, I shot that scene and then brought it back in and boom, everybody got it. So but for the people before I had not complained. But when it came in, they said, now we get it. Now okay. we get, get, the, get the social construct. So sometimes, you know, you have to trust your gut. And that's the, that's the, I mean, this has a positive. I had written it, removed it because of some amount of feedback, and then bought it back because of the uh, comprehensive uh, viewing of the film. Rajiv, you said you think in Malayalam. Sometimes. Nowadays, I think in Tamil. Okay. It's just that my Tamil is supremely accented. Right, but I mean, so have you never wanted to make a Malala movie? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, like I've never had an opportunity or I mean, there have been some talks about doing cinematography, but nothing really materialized. I would love to. I'm a great fan of Padmarajan. I'm a great fan of K.G. George's films. And um, I loved uh, Arvind and I approached Arvind to work as his assistant. I worked for a brief while with um, Shaji for some four or five days before they kind of fell ill. Um, so, I mean, I closely watch Malayalam cinema and I'm really excited by what's happening in Malayalam cinema now, especially Tundi Mudal and Drikshashi or Angamali Diaries. And there's a kind of a new energy that you are right. seeing uh, happening in Malayalam. And a lot of exciting young actors who are ready to, you know, really get into the role. So it's an exciting time in Malayalam. Uh, having said that, uh, I think I'm just looking for a script. And if, if the right script comes in, I, I will jump in. Uh, like I, I'm, 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 I'm really agnostic about the language. I started doing a Telugu film, then I've done Tamil films and made my thing here, and um, I've shot an English film on Carnatic music. I've done, uh, you know, Cheluvi, uh, which is a, a Hindi film, but by Girish Karnath. So I do anything provided there's something interesting in the script and there's something I don't know and hopefully I will learn while making the film. What have your 
cinematographic stints taught you? You just talked about learning while you were doing in films. You started out as a cinematographer. You're one of the first Steadicam operators. You got known by that and then you worked on big films. You started out with Chaitanya, right? With, yeah. uh, with Nagarjuna film. And then, you know, you've worked on Bombay and Guru and all these films. Uh, and uh, what, have, what have they taught you in terms of cinematography? I was kind of lucky to have shot um, some, uh, you know, can I say memorable films because you can end up doing a lot of big films where there's nothing new or big happening. When I mean big, I don't mean the shot being big, but I think a big idea. Or... Now, one had seen riots in Garam Hawa, well, otherwise we hadn't seen. So even Thomas was, uh, 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 came after that. So Bombay was, in that sense, the first time that somebody, whether well, riot took place in Bombay, but nobody in Bombay was making a film on that. And we guys sitting in Chennai were trying to make a film about Bombay. And I was a guy who kept going back and forth to Bombay all the time. I do it two times a month. So I know the city, I've lived in the city and things like that. So I kind of have an eye of what's actually Bombay and what's not Bombay. You know, so, so we shot only for like two days in Bombay and managed to convince everybody that it is Bombay. So we had sort of built the sets in, uh, uh, in Camper Cola factory. But to me, um, I think shooting the riots is definitely something that you, know, you need to create that kind of entropy, the kind of chaos, uh, it shouldn't look so staged and um, those kind of things that one sees uh, in the work of say Roland Joff and um, Chris Menges in Killing Fields or, um, or, or what Storaro did in, in a kind of more uh, dramatic fashion in Apocalypse Now. Right. Uh, these are kind of films that one had sort of studied and seen. Um, uh, so how much of the documentary style uh, and how much of the uh, typically um, can I say, I would also say that how much of nature is coming in, into your film was very important, you know. So to, to me, uh, cin cinematography is not just about placing some lights here and there and doing some dramatic lighting, or which I call is a kind of extended stage lighting for, for a period of time that dominated uh, cinematography, which is like you really put a blast of light and put, you know, smoke and you show shafts and things like that. But, but was actually more about choreography and uh, um, you know giving you a sense of it's really happening there. Right. So I mean, to me, like cinematically, some of the most beautiful moments in Bombay, of course, not only the riots, which is difficult to stage, but and very hot and very complex. But it's like this little thing about a girl has really run away from her house and she's gone through all the struggle and she comes and she's living with this man and. Is it all a bed of roses? It's not. I mean, they have a disagreement. And that's what makes Mani Ratnam very interesting to me as a director because he's writing a disagreement. It's not a fight. And this disagreement is uh, very beautiful. So it's just that little uh, flip of the half shutter. So you see that as part of the set and then say, okay, she's there inside and things. So where did this thing start? So it's starting from outside in the balcony and it sort of moves in. So things like... You know, you're outside, you're coming in. These were never done before. Like you could actually, when you're moving in, you're flipping your iris coming in. And that, you know, you could let the director choreograph things and sort of move. Because people, by nature, don't move the camera that much. But because I was a steady cam operator and I'm all the time moving the camera, I'm not scared of movement, you know. But it's still important that the design of the thing and the right movement, the right light has to come in and uh, it has to sort of thing. So... What is this woman? Uh, I mean, what is her mind? How are you getting inside that? How is the choreography going to come? What, what's the camera going to do? So I think a couple of scenes to me in Bombay are very important, which 90% which of people will miss, but to me is important. To me, the most important thing is, okay, the girl dances in a wedding. She sees this guy, but she's not a tomboy. She's not the typical Maniratnam heroine who's sort of, you know, like challenging, she's very coy and she's very shy, which is very unlike Mani's heroines. And so Manisha is that sense of very, um, Shaila Banu is uh, a, a kind of quiet, beautiful, uh, porcelain faced Muslim girl. So when she falls in love, then it becomes a big point for her to go from the confines of her house to take on the storm that's coming in. So. Shooting the song in a stormy area, bereft of anything, is just the 
bare walls of the fort and the storm which is coming in. And you know, you, you need skill to pull that off. I mean, I, I had seen that location for Ramanika Saris and I told Mani that I think this location is interesting, let's go for it. But, but then what happens is, you were lucky that it was raining and I had smashed my face and I had three stitches here, but we still were going in for the shoot after three days. But when you go there, you still should have your math right because if you shoot the, the what do you call, the, 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 the sea during the afternoon session on the west coast, it's going to bleach out. So the only way you're going to see when it's completely raining to see the horizon and the grey coming in is when you shoot towards the sea, you should be shooting in the morning because it keeps the sun behind you, though you can't see the sun. I mean, technical things like that, a lot of people make mistakes even now and I can see it happening when they shoot rain, they, they lose the horizon, they lose that kind of... The horizon is very important in a composition. The horizon and sky to me are most important things which give you a sense of freedom. So once you can that and when you got the storm and the, the ripping apart of the burqa and the people meeting and committing themselves, then how is she going to go? Is she going to leave her house? And she's going to leave her house. Every woman has to leave her house. But when, before she has it, there's this beautiful shot that, you know, she's just not, she's taking the Quran with her. And then, so we should, how do we do it? And we are shooting this in Bombay. We're going to be shooting in Polachi later. So we shot, uh, sorry, we shot the house in Express Estate. So all we had is the little thing. So we darkened the whole thing and had this thing, a little chest being opened and the camera you know, trolleys up above her. And she loves the man, but she has retains her faith. And that is the secular quality of Bombay. You know, that's the secular vision. It's not about a woman losing a burqa, but she believes in the Quran and she takes the Quran with her. So after you've given a shot, which is like that of even in a suspense horror film, which you're like going behind saying, what is she taking? What, what, what is she opening? What is she? So the, the box sort of tells you she's opening to take away some jewels. Is she going to steal the jewelry or not? And is she going to run away with the money? What, what, what's she going to do? And then suddenly you discover that uh, actually she's still wearing the burqa. And then you see, the, oh, she's opening it and she's actually got the Quran. So she's retaining her faith, but she's going for love. And that contradiction has to then play out that she's leaving the house. This is an important shot. She's not leaving the house. House. It's a house is what? Is it a door? Where is this house? So the house is in an idyllic place where there are peaks behind. And so you need to get that time of the day when it, the light's just falling behind the western guards and there's a glow there. And then so you light up the house and then she leaves the house. And that shot is held for more than 15, 16 seconds and she's, she opens the thing and you don't know what's happening. She's just holding there and there's a chant which has started a female doing some Islamic chant and, and then she starts moving and then she moves in one direction and then she moves left and then she moves here. At the end of 15 seconds, 16 seconds is when people realize that she's actually leaving her house and they start clapping. <laughs> and that's when you realize that even if you take a good shot, if the director doesn't hold the shot long enough, then the beauty of the shot is not there. Or that it sort of sets you up that she's going to leave this idyllic world. And so you need to have the design for the next shot. So the next shot is boom on, on Victoria Memorial and, and, and coming in. To me, cinematography is not about... Um, uh, just shots or just lighting, it's composition. I think composition and an idea, uh, idea of what is the director trying to say. So it's a cut between the idyllic village in which there is a house of a brick maker below the mountain. So she's not just leaving the house, she's leaving the village, she's leaving right. all this. I mean, it's in the twilight. She's leaving that environment. Environment. Yeah. So I think the landscape is very important, you know, and then you need to hold that shot. That's what makes cinema so beautiful, which I can't explore in advertising. I can't hold a shot for 15, 16 seconds. Yeah, half the hour. Yeah, just, yeah. It's, it's gone. I mean, it was my first big film, which was releasing in the theatre. and I sort of walked in for the first show and I could see people clapping and I knew, ooh, they were clapping for a shot. There was no close-up of the hero and there was nothing. It was just, they were clapping. And that's the beauty of Tamil cinema. And that's the great thing about Tamil film lovers. They clap for a shot. Yeah. Nowhere else in the world would they do it. 
They clap for when they see P.C. Shriram's name. They clap when they see Santosh Shivan's name. You know, just as cinematographers, and they enjoy cinema so much. So my last question to you is just that: it's they clap for Rajiv Men, and now you being such a terrific cinematographer, how are you able to? You don't shoot your own films. Uh, this film has been shot by Ravi Adav. Now, there's always going to be one part of you that's you cannot just switch off the cinematographer in you, right? Yeah. So you're going to always say, "This is the shot that I wanted." This is how I would have moved the trolley. This is how I would have zoomed in. This is how. How are you able to disconnect from that while you're handing over cinematographic duties to somebody else? I think it's important not to say this is the way I would have done it. I think this is the way we should do it. Is okay. the thing. So you first co-opt the person into your creative process. I think once you've done that, I mean, if you notice, I worked with Ravi, who was working with me. I worked with Ravi, I mean, Ravi Adav, who was also my classmate, and we, we don't have really much of an ego issue uh, going into that. However, I think um, my, my real problem with cinematography is that I really, I'm, I'm fastidious about where the edge of my uh, camera is. And like, I, I cannot have messy compositions. You mean the frame? Yeah, the frame must be perfect. You know, for me, um, the tension that you get in the visual tension is, is really about uh, when you operate, you must be feel that. Uh, and if I were to operate, and if I were to make a mistake in that, uh, I would be gutted, you know. So like, I, I really take my cinematography very seriously. Seriously enough to say that when I'm panning, I'm very clear that it has to finish here, it means it must finish here, it cannot be here or there, you know. So if that happens, it, your concentration has to be, your breathing rhythm, everything is about getting that operation right. When you're doing all this, you have missed the actor's face. It so happens that I'm also interested in, in the acting. But as a director, my main concern is what's happening to the actor's eyes. So if I'm not available for my actors and I'm saying I'm getting a great shot, it's like saying that operation successful to patient dead. You know, it's like typical Mylapo joke that will happen. You got a good looking film, but it doesn't emotionally move you. So I need to have an idea, communicate my idea, co-opt my cinematographer into the creative process, but maintain a certain distance away from that so that I can be fully available for my actor. So when you watch the rushes and when you find out that the panning has gone on for four frames, five frames longer than you would have, uh, you know, uh, allowed it to, how do you feel? I mean, it's never the same. It will be different, but that's what you're hoping that somebody else will come in and do. You know, it, um, I mean, you have to be bullheaded and stupid to think that only your way is the right way. No, I don't think so. No, I'm I mean, like some you're... people are very, very fastidious about the exact, um, you know, uh, thing. But you can actually correct that with asking for, if it's completely off, you can ask for one more sh shot. I mean, you can ask for the take Im immediately. Um, yeah, now you, you see everything on yeah, the camera. You, so, you, you yeah. can always yeah. ask, ask yeah. for another take and you're, you're pretty much next to the camera. You, you can feel it. You don't even look at the monitor. You've been long enough in the business just to stand next to the camera and in the way the man is moving, you know what's coming and not going. I mean, we guys shot Bombay when there was no video assistant. It was just money turning on saying, is it okay? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Focus is okay. Somebody's not staring and laughing at the camera. Everything has to be okay. But there was no video assist and all the riots. So, I think... People are spoiled. Like, like, you know, you have all the video assistant thing, and you've got a lot more out of focus shots than what it was. I mean, concentration levels are lower now than what it was. I think, by nature, I'm not a person who can do two things. Some people can. They have an ability to uh, write and listen to music and things like that. I listen to music or I write. I mean, I, don't, I can't do two things at the same time. And I think that same applies for me as far as cinematography. I mean, I really take it so seriously that I don't want to goof it up. Like, I would be gutted if I take an out-of-focus shot, but the actor acted well and I'm forced to keep it. I mean, there are places where it happens, you know. But if it's done by somebody else, it's amazing. It's his mistake, you know. But uh, I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. So, I can't concentrate on two things at the same time. Because I, I, the reason I asked is also because I just saw Roma mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago and Alfonso Cuaron did the... He directed and shot it. And something, while I was watching the film, I just felt that he just transferred his his thing onto the screen, you know, and which nobody else could have probably done. There were a couple of 
like long takes that you felt he was in the moment uh, and that you know nobody else could have yeah. done it the way he did which is you know so i thought you must yeah have... yeah it is it, it's going to happen it's going to happen more and more because i think cinematography has moved away from the math that you required to earlier days when you exposed in film you, you got to have your math right i mean you had to get your exposure right and uh, you spent least sleepless nights i mean with not knowing whether you got your exposure right i mean that whole the function is gone it's like uh, i mean people are coming to, majority of the young cameramen come to the set without a light meter so like that's right it's like, it's like like because creating an image is no more a mystery i mean everybody is seeing an image all the time on their mobile phones and they cannot take the same uh, factor in the same kind of confidence oh, yeah you will get an image like we grew up with the thing oh shit uh, the image may not come it will be completely dark i mean what what will be happen you know but that fear is not there because that fear is not there it's like singer singing with pitch correction anybody can sing you can pitch correct i mean so if i have an idea why can't i sing so it's the same thing if i want to shoot a film i don't have to worry about the math and knowing color temperature and all that i'll get some image it doesn't matter i i need that energy i need to be part i don't want to listen and fight with another cinematographer i can i mean i don't see another cinematographer as a problem or as a fight i see it as a collaboration with whom you can sort of discuss and say does this idea work am i goofing up because my direction is wrong or my writing is wrong or, or the lighting i mean how do we get this thing working i mean there are so many things you can do to make a scene come alive and it's great to have another person on the set and i remember steven spielberg saying that he had acrimonious relationship being the most successful director in the world with most of the cinematographer till he got janusz kaminski and janusz kaminski came into po- from poland without knowing any english and all he could ask is eggs and omelet and barely spoke english at all long time but he said when he had janusz on the set he felt he had a younger brother on the set i think the relationship between a cinematographer and a director i uh, shouldn't be acrimonious and you got to accept that the director is the elder brother and you're the younger brother thank you rajiv that was great talking to us always thank you look forward to the film thank you thank rajiv yeah. pleasure being on your show hi this is rajiv menon and you're watching me on film companion south do subscribe and watch film companion south